Hello. Um, welcome to Writing Excess in Plain C. Um, I have to give credits to this talk, uh, for the idea for this talk, to Stefan Mueller, who came up with this concept of teaching excess code, and I got the concept from him. The code samples in this talk are on GitHub. My name is Bulk88. I have a pause ID. Um, I'm mostly seen in the Perl community on the P5P mailing list, and I use Perl on Windows and do a lot of Perl, Windows, and C coding. The Perl interpreter is written in C89. It's a large pile of machine code and it's memory unsafe. The Perl interpreter is not written in Java. There's basically one way to escape the Perl interpreter, JSON RPC to a daemon. Nah, I'm kidding. Um, Either you have to use Xsubs or you have to use keywords. Xsubs can be monkey patched, uh, but keywords are permanent. You cannot monkey patch a Perl keyword at runtime in Perl. Perl is also kind of fat, so sometimes you have to use C for speed and performance reasons. Excess code is converted to C code by a program called Xsubpp. Uh, Xsubpp was created in Perl 5 Alpha 4 in 1993. And xsubpp is a descendant of a tool called MUS, which was introduced in Perl 3 in 1990. Uh, MUS was created to let curses be usable from the Perl language, I believe. To understand why excess is so hard to program, you have to understand that when excess was written, it was written in the era of KNRC, not C89, but KNRC, because C89 was one year old when XS was invented. Also, XS is considered to be macro soup. The pros of using XS versus this plain C code I will show you is you have actual source code compatibility and you aren't using undocumented calls for everything. Also, the macros can be update, upgraded internally by P5P between Perl releases without breaking your code. And everything I tell you today is a bunch of undocumented APIs, so don't cry to P5P if your code breaks because you used a bunch of undocumented APIs. And again, all examples in this talk are from Perl 522 because there's no backwards or forwards compatibility if you skip the official APIs. How to make um, how to make Xsubs appear in the Perl language? The main two tools is either Xs Loader or Dyna Loader. In this diagram, yellow boxes are C code and blue boxes are pure Perl subs. Your PM file calls the Xs Loader. The Xs Loader uh, then calls DL Load File. The DL Load File then calls the OS specific shared library loader and the OS will load a shared library into the Perl process. Excess loader will then take your package, uh, Excess loader will take your package name, prefix boot, and replace the colons with underscores to create a C symbol name. It then asks DL find symbol, and DL find symbol calls the OS shared library loader to get the C function pointer for the boot X sub in your XS shared library. Once a DL find symbol returns the X uh, sub C function pointer back to XS loader, XS loader then calls DL install X sub. Uh, and DL install X sub connects this C function pointer into the Perl language and creates a type glob with a subroutine inside that you can now call from the Perl language. Wait a minute. Uh-oh. Access language. Uh, once the boot Xub is uh, created, it's then executed. This is the first time you actually get control uh, of your, uh, you get control in the C language inside the Perl engine. Uh, normally, the boot X sub will call new XS repeatedly and connect additional C function pointers to Perl subroutines. Um, 
after the boot X sub has run and registered all additional X subs that that uh, shared library, that XS module is going to attach to the Perl engine, XS loader pretty much immediately returns control to your PM file. Every single Perl X sub must have this prototype. Even though I said I won't be showing, um, I won't be showing macro soup. There is one macro that I will be using in this talk. The first argument uh, of every X sub is the, the C uh, is the Perl engine pointer. Now on unthreaded Perls, the first argument doesn't exist. Instead, just the CV argument, uh, the second argument exists. Um, in order for on unthreaded pearls, you have to drop the engine pointer and the PTH macro allows the engine pointer to be dropped out on unthreaded pearls. So I'm going to use the PTHX macro for the remainder of this talk. Um, this is the layout of a CV pointer. This is the C representation of a Perl subroutine. The green things are things that are interesting to an excess programmer. The red things are just only used for pure Perl subroutines and the yellow things are sometimes used by excess programmers. Uh, up here we have the C function pointer that implements the X sub and there is also what's uh, in interesting about the CV struct is there is a void pointer called any down here and it can be used to implement uh, closures or fast lookup of C++ object pointers that are attached to this uh, X sub. Now the XS any, this any member is not backed by any storage, it has no ownership. So in order to free whatever you're storing in this any pointer, you still have to use the linked list of magic, which is here to have a free uh, destructor that will free the any member uh, when this whole uh, CV or subroutine is destroyed at some point during the Perl engine's lifetime. Um, the Perl stack has a number of design requirements. Um, Perl has no traditional concept of prototypes. All subroutines are var arg incoming and coming out. Want array isn't really used by most Perl code and context is, nobody really cares about context. Uh, the Perl, uh, Perl it has to implement call frames or stack frames because this isn't basic and we're not using go to line numbers. Uh, also, at underscore is a window into the Perl stack and um, when, you, when you call a subroutine, there's a local that's going on behind the scenes that will swap out the at underscores to point at different parts of the Perl stack. Um, and also, the Perl stack can be reallocated memory-wise at any point in time, and it grows at random points whenever it's needed through the lifespan of a Perl process. So somebody could, in theory, reallocate the Perl stack to being hundreds of terabytes big if they choose so, although uh, clearly that's I don't think anyone wants a Perl stack that's hundreds of terabytes big. Um, on the Perl stack, your input, or the input to a subroutine is also the output of a subroutine. You're only allowed to store, um, you're only allowed to store uh, the null pointer and pointers to reference counted things like scalars, hashes, and arrays on the Perl stack. You're not allowed to store arbitrary random data on the Perl stack. Uh, there will be segvs in some cases if you try storing uh, gibberish on the Perl stack. Um, also, the Perl stack doesn't really have a concept of context because it's optional to care about context in Perl. And really, list is more than one argument. On Perl stack, scalar is one arg and void is zero arguments. Um, in the Pure Perl want array information is available in C if you want it, uh, so don't worry about the want array information being available. Um, the Perl stack, uh, the Perl stack starts at something called PL stack base and it ends at PL stack max. Um, the, P, the Perl stack is shared by all of the subroutines that are currently in the call stack. And 
when you are called, you get an incoming piece of Perl stack. There's also, in theory, you could have a private zone of some scalars, and then you have an outgoing zone to any child calls you make. Um, the incoming and outgoing parts of Perl stack have mixed ownership between the caller and the callee. Um, to know where your piece of Perl stack begins, you have to look at the mark stack and the mark stack pointer. And the I32 that is underneath the mark stack pointer is an index, not a pointer, but an index to a position on the Perl stack. This position on the Perl stack isn't you don't own the memory that is underneath this position, but if you have any memory, if you have any incoming arguments, they will be right after where index points to. Um, if PL stack SP is usually the end, uh, is the last valid incoming element, except if PL stack SP is basically pointing to the red zone, which means it's identical to what mark is, then you have zero incoming arguments. Uh, the minimum X sub that you can write is this. Each X sub has an obligation to decrease the mark stack by one position. It doesn't need to read what's on the mark stack, but it just has to decrease that pointer. Um, also, um, if you actually execute this uh, X sub, it's basically going to just return at underscore. All of the incoming arguments became the outgoing arguments because we didn't manipulate any positions of the Perl stack, of the mark stack or the Perl stack. Um, counting the number of incoming arguments. Every single X sub has this common prolog. You have to read off the global position of stack pointer and then read off uh, your index on the mark stack. You then have to compute where your mark pointer is. This is the uh, position to the like zero element of not it's not an incoming it's not your incoming element but it's the start of your uh, area of Perl stack and then by taking SP minusing mark and doing point arithmetic you can get the number of total incoming items you also have the obligation to decrease the mark stack pointer by one um, now in order to make a scalar to return to our caller, we have to create a scalar and set it to the number of items. Now, um, in Perl, if you, the Perl stack does not own any scalars, scalar pointers that are on it. Every scalar pointer on the Perl stack has to be owned by some other data structure in the Perl engine. If you don't know uh, which data, or where, what is supposed to own a scalar on Perl stack? You probably want it to be owned by the Mortal stack, which uh, is used to store temporarily, to store scalars temporarily, and they will be freed in the near future. Um, you also have to wipe the incoming arguments because in our previous slide we were returning all of add underscore to our caller. So to wipe the incoming arguments to zero, we simply set mark to SP. And also, um, because um, we may have actually gotten zero arguments in this subroutine, we have to bounds check the Perl stack and make sure that we have space to put one element on it. And uh, this could possibly reallocate SP, the SP pointer to a new memory address. We then increase SP by one position stick our scalar we created up here onto the Perl stack and then we have to copy our local uh, Perl stack pointer to the global Perl stack pointer so that our caller knows where that we advanced SP by one and we have one element that we're returning to our caller. Um, let's, let's see how we're doing on time. Not good. Um, to print a scalar, uh, we have the standard prologue um, that every single X sub has. This is why you don't write, try writing XS in plain C because you have to keep writing all of this repetitive prologue code over and over. Uh, we have to remove, uh, we have to back up the mark stack by one pointer. We always do it. 
And if we didn't get one item, uh, we have to croak because our caller didn't pass us one item. Everything in Perl is basically var arg. Uh, we read our first and only argument, and then we have to try to extract a string pointer out of the scalar. Now, in Perl, if the flags of the scalar say that it is a string, we can directly read the string out of the scalar. Otherwise, we have to call a casting uh, C function that will convert the scalar into a string pointer and return that to us. We then can just print uh, using C standard library the string and then we have, and because up here we check the number of items is equal to one, we can absolutely just decrease SP by one slot instead of doing the mark assignment and then we have to move SP, copy SP to the global SP so our caller uh, knows that we returned no, or we returned an empty list or no arguments to our caller. <sighs> to sum a list, um, again we have our standard prologue. We have, a, uh, in this case, we back up SP by the number of items to the start of our, uh, the starting position of our Perl stack. Now, because by subtracting items from SP, we're basically recreating the mark pointer. Um, down here, we have to do plus one when we dereference SP because the start of SP is to one before our start, uh, our start of the zone of, SP, of stat Perl stack that we own. We loop through um, all of the scalars on the Perl stack that we that were given to us. Again, we have to go through the flags of each scalar, and if the flags say that it, there's a double inside of the scalar, we can directly read the double. Otherwise, we have to do the casting, uh, call the Perl C casting function. We then, add all, um, we then add the numbers, and that's it. At the end, um, Again, we have, uh, because, you know, summing a list, we could have been past zero arguments. So we have to, again, bounce check the Perl stack, create a mortalized uh, Perl scaler to own the scaler that we're creating. We then put the scaler we just created on the, we advance the Perl stack by one, we put the scaler on the Perl stack, and then we have to copy the new position of the Perl stack pointer to the global stack pointer for our caller. Let's see. I'm not sure if I have time to get through the rest of this talk. Um, the following code in Exa in plain C is basically this is the pure Perl version of the code. And what I'm going to demonstrate is how to call an X sub from an X sub without going through the Perl engine. Uh, we have the standard prologue of our X sub. Um, now, in order to call an X sub, we actually have to create our own mark entry because each X sub pops a mark entry. We also have to bounce check the mark stack because just like the Perl stack, this is C and everything has to be bounce checked. We create a new mark entry by um, taking the end of our uh, incoming zone of Perl arguments, which is SP, minusing it by base to create an index, and then assigning the index to the mark stack. We then have to grow, uh, do another possible reallocation of the Perl stack. Now, in, in every X sub, if you call an X sub, the arguments that you pass to the X sub are wiped when that X sub returns. Um, they're wiped when it returns. So you have to copy your incoming arguments to a separate zone of Perl stack to be your outgoing arguments. You then have to update the global Perl stack pointer position. And then uh, directly call the Perl C func the, the X sub the X sub C function pointer with the okay, I'm not making any sense. Uh, yeah, with the CV pointer. Once the, X, the child X sub calls, we refetch the global stack pointer position and then we recompute the number of items that it returned to us. Uh, are we out of, yeah, I think we're out of time. 
Questions? I don't think we have time. Yes? Um, the advantages of uh, this is um, the advantages of doing it this way is knowing how the macros and on a Turing machine level and on a machine code level how these uh, macros are written and when there's something wrong or segvies in your X subs you actually know how to diagnose uh, your arguments list and what's wrong with your incoming or outgoing uh, arguments lists in X subs. Is that it for questions? Uh, I had a quick one. Um, so if you use just success, just running through the uh, bank and you get the, uh, the actual C file that Pro will create from all of the macros and all of the uh, next sub GP, um, would there be any other differences that you didn't cover? Um, the code that I showed you would be, is, an, is a .i file. It's not really a .c file. It's after all the macros were expanded, and uh, because a .c file isn't really a valid uh, C language file anyway, it has to go through the C preprocessor, which expands a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, the code I showed you is basically a .i file, not a .c file. Uh, very little differences from what I showed you from what the .i file would look like. There's almost no differences. Is that it for questions? Okay, thank you.